Hello and welcome to another episode of Pakistanomy. My name is Uzair Yunus and per usual over the last few weeks uh, we've been taking a look away from the economic crisis in Pakistan and and things that are happening perhaps on a more positive note or on a more future oriented mode in the country. So today we'll continue that trend. Um I have the honor of hosting with me Leila Sarhan. Uh Leila is the group country manager and senior vice president at Visa. focused on Pakistan um has over two decades of experience in leadership positions uh has previously worked at Microsoft's public sector business across the gulf um and has been the general manager for operations in North Africa Pakistan East Mediterranean um so really somebody who has deep 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 expertise and an understanding not only of doing business in Pakistan but as i understand of like cultural um experiences in Pakistan as well and so we're going to talk to Leila about visa what visa is up to in Pakistan how does she see the market evolving and the opportunities there and more importantly what needs to happen more to catalyze some of the trends that we on this podcast have talked about about digitization financial inclusion etc so Leila first of all welcome to Pakistan to me and thank you for taking out the time today oh thank you so much for having me you there and thank you for the introduction I want to begin by you know if I were to ask a ordinary Pakistani or the audience that's tuning in to tell me what they think of visa they'll think about debit and credit cards and you swipe your card and that's it but you know that's obviously not what only the only thing visa does that's on the consumer side that's where the consumer intersects with you and your company so maybe give us a bit of a 101 about what visa has been doing in Pakistan and what its strategy has looked like and evolved in the country Yeah. Yeah, so so uh, I I get this all the time. Uh actually from a lot of people is okay, what what is Visa doing besides, you know, credit card, debit cards and things like this. I mean, we position ourselves really as a network of networks. Um uh, we position ourselves as if you want to, our vision is to be the best way to pay and be paid. and everything that comes around it from a building an ecosystem perspective um and and uh, and probably in the course of the conversations will come a little bit more into the details but i want i don't want to bore the audience on, uh, on on this one if if i think of our presence in pakistan um i think let me first by positioning um what is pakistan for visa right and, and i'm going to apologize to the audience if i'm going to state some obvious matters but it's good to understand the lens through which um we're looking at um so first i mean pakistan is very large population the fifth largest globally fairly young population i think estimation says that uh, 50% of the population will be under 25 years of age by 2040 that's around the corner so obviously a very tech savvy digital native uh, population still very rural um which means that um access is an important pillar um uh to to do anything in pakistan and access is also an important pillar in the 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 visa strategy um if i think of the financial ecosystem in pakistan right it's quite balanced um you look at the number of banks the digital wallets um the latest digital banking licenses that were awarded and that are probably will be coming up in the next 12 to 18 months um a newly launched real time payment system in the country uh, so it's quite balanced uh, i would say i mean all the players are represented all the players you would see in any market are represented in 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 pakistan yet uh, financial inclusion is still very 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 uh, whether we speak about micro uh, small and medium enterprises uh, which we see as really the heart of any economy um one of the stats that we look at is okay 200,000 more or less of those 5 million estimated ms smes in pakistan accept digital payments and if 4.8 million are not accepting digital payment probably they're not also using digital payment to pay uh, to pay others um and and we know that um on the uh, individual level um 35 million out of 120 million adults have access to financial services so obviously financial inclusion 
is a big, big topic and a big focus uh, for, for Pakistan. And all of this for us as a company translates into really an immense opportunity in terms of driving financial inclusion, bringing new digital innovations and new digital technologies in the payment system, but also providing access and a long lasting impact um, in the market. If I want to zoom in into more concrete initiatives, let's say, I mean, moving from macro to more on the micro level, what we've seen in the past three, four years across the region, uh, and I, I speak specifically about the Middle East, North Africa, and Pakistan, um, we've seen really an acceleration uh, to the migration of e-commerce, and, and that has fueled the growth of digital commerce in the region. Uh, Pakistan stands today as the 47th largest market for e-com. And we see a tremendous opportunity for this to grow. And we've seen the growth that happened in the past uh, in the past few years. And, and, and based on this, towards the mid of last year in 2022, we've actually run a survey with consumers in Pakistan. And the findings were quite interesting, right? Um, I mean, you remember the stats I talked about in terms of financial inclusion. But what's interesting is that consumers in Pakistan actually want to be financially included um, and they want to be more digital. So one of the, some of the findings of our, um, it, it was called the Stay Secure Survey. Some of the findings showed that 85% of Pakistani consumers would switch stores or online shopping and sites based on the payment methods that are offered to them. And most consumers will indicate that they have a very strong preference for digital payments over cash, right? Um, let's think of some of the emerging trends that we're seeing. Buy now, pay later, for example. In Pakistan, in our survey, around two thirds of the consumers that were surveyed said that they're familiar with BNPL. And 65% said they would likely switch to stores or online sites or app apps that offered a BNPL option. So also demonstrating that some of these emerging payment trends uh, are uh, very popular across consumers uh, uh, in in Pakistan. So yeah, this is kind of the way we frame our opportunity uh, in, in in the country. Well, that's that's good to hear. And I mean, again, as you were explaining some of the gaps, right? Last week, um, I had uh, the CEO of the Universal Service Fund, which is a public sector entity trying to connect, um, you know, the country to the internet. Um, and he talked about this being the rails without which nothing really works on the fintech side, digital payment side, e-commerce side, which you just talked about. Um, and he said the same thing, that there is a huge unmet need um, and people want access. Now the question is, how do you enable that access? And if you provide that access, then innovation just happens naturally because people know about these things and know that they want a certain type of product or sort of access to services. And on the financial inclusion side and the digital side in particular, um, there's obviously a gender divide, right? So when you provide that yeah. connectivity, it transforms. And we know one of the big issues in Pakistan is female labor force participation and access to economic ac activities, banking access for women. And I think that the data you shared resonates with me because when I talk to people, nobody likes going to Pakistani banks, right? They'd rather do it on their phone because it's a terrible, terrible experience. You talk to anybody and they'll, they'll have stories about this. So I was curious to hear your thoughts on when there is such a big unmet need, what are some of the barriers that you've seen in the region and specifically in Pakistan that perhaps um, the private sector and the public sector have to circumvent to really meet this unmet demand and unleash sort of the a digital payments revolution, something like what happened in India, for example, right? That we've yeah. seen over the last five, 10 years. Yes. So it's interesting, the example you're giving. I mean, I think globally, nobody wants to deal with his bank or her bank, right? Uh, I remember I was meeting with one of the uh, really prominent bankers in Pakistan a very long time ago. Um, you mentioned I was working with Microsoft, so we're working on the digital transformation of the bank. And and it was, I mean, he he actually told me nobody wants to come to the bank. Nobody wants to come to the branch and we really need to go digital. Um, I think Pakistan has done some progress there. Uh, if we look at some of the statistics from the State Bank of Pakistan, if I remember well, 
Um, there, there has been a rise in terms of the use of e-banking, whether it's mobile or internet banking. What we've seen is really double digit increase uh, in the value of the, the transaction, but also in the volume of transactions, uh, right? I mean, the number of mobile banking transactions has grown really double digits in the high 22, 23% uh in, in 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 Pakistan so yeah there is there is definitely a, a need uh, for this if if you want to think of the challenges right this and and I think that's that's really your questions um I think it looking at Pakistan it, it remains a cash intensive economy um and, and you know when I talk to central bankers I tell them um, we we actually have the same objective. We want to eradicate cash together, uh, and and bring digital payments into and uh, in, into play. And, and when you look of ca cash based economies, uh, there are a few challenges. Uh, one and and I would put them in, in in three buckets. Let's say right. One is education, two is infrastructure, and three is security. And thinking of uh, most cash-based economy uh, economies today really suffer from a lack of financial literacy. Uh, very little interoperability, um, lack of infrastructure and access. We talked about that. Uh, but also a lot of security threats, uh, which, uh, which pose really challenges when it comes to accelerating digital payments, right? People, whether it's, because people are not educated enough around security or the infrastructure is not ready from a security perspective to go digital. And, um, and, and, and we know that the bad actors um, out there are becoming smarter and smarter and smarter. Uh, going back of, uh, to security, uh, and I think that's really one of the key challenges. Um, what we've seen is that a lot of the consumers uh, will consider that the security of, of a payment facility offered, let's say, online on a website will be really the top reason for them to choose to pay with their digital payment facility rather than cash uh, on delivery, right? Um, and the other thing is that security is really the top factor when you consider a digital payment option. What we do as Visa is really we look at security as a collective responsibility. Uh, and um, we work closely to educate consumers on how to stay safe. And there's a lot of education that needs to be made there. I mean, most of the fraud happened because of social engineering, right? Um, you receive an OTP, someone calls you and tells you, give me your OTP. I'm, I'm sorry to I... interrupt you on this one because I don't know if you've seen this. There's a fantastic Netflix drama uh, out of India called Jamtara, which is exactly about these scams through mobile phone and OTP calls, uh, where people, you know, the syndicate in in rural India is scamming people, um, and there's an investigation and all of that. And it's basically that, right? You receive a text, somebody calls you pretending to be the banker. They ask you for your OTP and all of a sudden you're out of money that that you, you it's exactly. your money. And, and so many people fall for this, right? And because again, the bad actors are are becoming so smart uh, that uh, today they 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 I mean you anyone can fall for it. I I myself the other day I received an OTP and I looked at it and I said and, and, and it was someone who was trying to add my card to their Apple Pay. Imagine if my card is added to their Apple Pay because Apple Pay uses an amazing technology which is called tokenization, right? Which is really taking your, if you look at your card, there's a 16 digit number. Um, it takes that 16 digit number, it masks it and transform it into a secure token um, which really make your transaction very secure. Right. So no need for a pin, no need for an OTP, no need for all of this. Because I, this I love good. using Apple Pay. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> exactly. And, and, and Apple Pay or any pay uh, is a game changer uh, in the market because it really provides 
that type of security. So there's a lot of education to be done with people in terms of, you know, do not give your pit. It goes from the basic things that do not give your pin, do not give your, you know, your little three digit code, your CVV code. Um, what's important in financial education as well is to start really young, uh, right? And the younger you start, um, actually a lot of statistics have shown that kids that have received financial education are likely to earn more when they become adults. Uh, because they understand the value of money, but they also understand concepts like, you know, savings, um, what is credit, how much credit can you take, uh, and things like that. Um, so the education is one part, the technology and the infrastructure is another part. Um, I'm, I, I mentioned tokenization. I mean, I think tokenization is probably one of the most powerful technologies that we brought to the payment systems. And it's what's behind um, use cases like Apple Pay. Um, where you're really taking that that card number, which is so important, right? You mask it, encrypt it, and it's a secure token uh, that really protects uh, protects you from uh, from those bad actors or those uh, those uh, fraudsters. Uh, and financial education, when we talk about education, it's not only about kids. Uh, I think there's a lot of financial literacy as well. That needs to happen with um, the the micro uh, micro and small and medium enterprises mm -hmm. uh, in terms of how they need to manage their money, how they manage their working capital, inventory, and things like that. And we've been doing many many initiatives uh, in Pakistan specifically uh, specifically around this. The the education on the MSME side is is a very interesting point because like I've seen some. Uh, research even out of Pakistan and even globally in emerging frontier markets, right? That small business owners see there being no cost of cash, but there is a cost of cash. It's just that they don't think about it that way. And when you actually break it down to them, something clicks, right? From everything from having to wait for that cash to come in because there's a delay period in that transaction being cleared to sending somebody that who works for you to the bank to deposit the cash or take it out or collect checks and all of that thing. Um, and I think people don't think about it that way. So there's the education part over there. But then also the other point you made is super interesting is on educating younger people. You said how, you know half of Pakistan's population under 25, currently over 65% under 30. The time value of money, how does money grow? How do you manage your credit, build up your credit? It's something that's not taught in schools in most countries of the world, even over here where I am in the United States, it's a big issue um, in terms of, you know, when I even talk to some of my friends uh, who did not study finance in undergrad, right? And I have to explain to them, well, time value of money is X and this is how you think about your savings rate and all of that. Um, they're just like, what? We never were taught this. And I'm like, how, how the education system in my view is failing if a capitalist society primarily, which is most of the world now, um, is not teaching its citizens how capitalism, aka money works. Um, and so, I think it's 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 a huge, huge opportunity in Pakistan as well, because I'll put my macro hat on for a moment, then that deals with the savings and investment ratios in the economy, it deals with modernization, formalization of flows, all the things that you know, we frequently talk about with economists on that po on this podcast as being problems, right? And you're on the micro end of the solution um, uh, to this problem here as well. So I'm curious to hear about like what is Visa doing in Pakistan to really, uh, you know, have that kind of an impact in the market that you know realizes the opportunity not only for Visa as a business, but also unlocks all these opportunities that we've talked about. Uh, which are badly needed in a country that's young, growing, and and knows that it needs digital access. Yeah. So so uh, I mean, it, it goes from um, you know very small initiatives, right? Uh, in terms of going around schools, really doing some bespoke uh, things. We're actually now um, putting in place a full financial uh, education. Um, plan specifically for uh, for Pakistan, financial awareness plan specifically for Pakistan using digital media, but also we want to work with some of the school networks, uh, university networks, 
so we bring that curriculum uh, into the into those schools and universities, and 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 that that's 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 something that we um, we're, we're planning haven't done yet, but this is definitely something we're investing in. Uh, we've invested a lot in the um, uh, the SME. I would say the SME education. So some of the things that we've done is um, we the, we have a curriculum available which is called practical business skills, um, and that's we launched this globally. Uh, it's part of a, a global initiative uh, that a visa or a global objective that Visa has put for itself in terms of enabling more than fifty million businesses um, to on the digital side, right? To become more digital, whether they wanna go online or start accepting digital payment and start paying in a digital way. And that practical uh, business skills is, is really a platform that deliver free education resources with more than 50 online uh, modules, right? On topics, like I was saying, you know, managing, organizing, digitizing, protecting, growing your business. Uh, inventory, working capital, taking credit, uh, things like that. So we used, um, and I'm sure you know the name, uh, we used Daraz, which is a, 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 I mean, a fantastic marketplace, but also an aggregator of so many of those uh, very, very, very small merchants, uh, right? And we signed an agreement with the Daraz University and launched the Practical Business Skills in Pakistan. We had thousands and thousands of micro businesses enroll in the practical business skills, uh, taking the courses, graduating from those courses, getting their certification. Um, and and I, it's, it's been it's been extremely successful from an SME, uh, I would say an SME perspective. And we continue, we continue doing it. And we've done it, of course, in Urdu, uh, so that, you know, because most of these are um, home home businesses, right? Um, maybe a, a, a lady that do some crafts or that sells uh, uh, cooked food or something like that. So uh, so it's really about how do we reach the biggest number there? Yeah, I think that that was the case study you mentioned in terms of micro businesses and, and usually a, a woman doing uh, some of being entrepreneurial. Um, again, my last guest was saying exactly that when through the USF, they connected this village in rural Sindh um, to the internet. And yeah. all of a sudden, um, this woman became an Instagram entrepreneur, sort of buying local handicraft from around the village that she was a part of and then selling it. Um, and then through that, she sent her brother to a technical school to the nearby city. Um, and again, all of that was enabled uh, because of access to the internet. But if she wants to scale... That's she needs financial literacy, right? About how do you manage your books, exactly. how do you build your credit, and and all of that exactly. good stuff that comes exactly. with that. Um, so that's amazing. Um, yeah. In terms of, um, you know, we one of the things that I often look at globally, and it's become a global conversation, is the IMF World Bank Spring Meeting here as well. A lot of conversation on digital public infrastructure. The Gates Foundation talks about, you know, real-time payment systems. They help build Pakistan's ROS network. Omidyar talks about the identity stack and its role in tokenizing identity, which then connects to things like Apple Wallet and, and other private mm -hmm. sector uh, things. What are some global trends that you're seeing in terms of the financial inclusion conversation that perhaps folks in Pakistan ought to pay attention to as well? And the reason why I ask this question is, you know, when you have huge unmet need and a lack of infrastructure, that's a problem, perhaps. I look at it as an opportunity because it's a leapfrog opportunity, right? You can create next-gen infrastructure without being tied to the old generation legacy architecture that perhaps exists in many developed markets like the U.S. Very hard to innovate in the U.S. versus a place like Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, from my yeah. perspective. So what are things that stand out to you in this global era of digitization that perhaps Pakistanis also ought to be paying more attention to as an opportunity? There are many, many initiatives around the world. If you want to think of, um, and, and specifically when you think of government initiatives, right? Um, how government enable I mean, I look at the government or the regulator, such as Central Bank or the State Bank of Pakistan, in this case, as an enabler 
uh, for uh, for digitization more than more than an operator or a or a direct player into this. I mean, uh, that's that's I think that's the, that's an important point um, that we see. And where government have played the role of enablers, we've seen really a big shift. I mean, um, if you think of whether it's through um, some rules and mandates that governments have put in place. So um, we've seen governments coming up, coming and saying, um, you know, in that sector, in a specific sector, let's say fuel um, or education, uh, payments will only happen in the in a digital form, and no cash payment need to happen. So that's a mandate, right? Uh, but then when you also see incentives behind them. So we've seen, for example, um, in a country like Greece, where a lot, and I think it's very similar to Pakistan, where a lot of small and medium enterprises were actually trying to be under the radar, I would say. Um, and and the, the gray economy has been growing, and which is the case as well in Pakistan, where a lot of uh, SMEs are trying to, let's say, um, avoid paying taxes, maybe, um, or are afraid that if they start accepting digital payments, opening a bank account, then the government is going to come and take all their money in taxes, uh, right? So tax incentives have been working. Uh, and I think it takes a bold move for a country to say, you know what, I'm going to forego part of my taxes for a certain period of time um, because you want to build a habit. Uh, moving to digital, and you, you mentioned how much you love Apple Pay, right? It's a habit. Nobody told you, you know, Apple Pay is great. You, you tried it one time, two times, and it becomes a habit. Uh, so you want to build that habit. You want to build that habit with consumers. You want to build that habit with merchants. Um, and and you take that bold move to say, maybe I'll forego some income for a while. But anyway, I was not getting that income. Get Give some tax incentives so that people enter the digital economy. You, you take the bold move to forego some income. You create that habit in people in small and small and medium enterprises and consumers so that they build a habit and then they cannot go back. I mean, uh, you, once you you become digital, it's very hard to go back to your old uh, to your old habit, and you just move on uh, and 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 do this. And, and and I was saying in Pakistan, we've seen pockets of this happening at the province level. So the uh, Punjab province has done some incentive for uh, the the consumer, but also for the merchants. So there some restaurants. So for in the hospitality sector, restaurants get a tax break, but also consumer get a, a, a rebate on the sales tax when they pay digitally. So these things work, okay? Incentives, the carrot works. So, I, and this is the, really the role that I would see government playing. The other role I would see the government needs to play is really, um, uh, uh, again, as an enabler, how do we have an open market and a level playing field approach where many players can come in and many players and many players are interested i mean just remember the stats i talked about at the beginning you tell anyone that you can target a population of 240 million people that's going to become 300 million in a few years, right? You tell anyone you have the potential to go after this market. Many regional players would want to come and take advantage of this, but you need to enable them to enter this market. You need to enable them to compete, to innovate, uh, and, and, and really open the doors for them. I think what State Bank of Pakistan has done by granting some of those digital banking licenses to many players um, from around the globe, so from um, from Africa, from the Middle East, uh, from uh, from Asia and Singapore, uh, is great. It's is it's allowing you know uh, those innovators to come in and be in the market. Let's make sure that the policies that are being put in place 
will continue to enable them to innovate and compete uh, at a level playing field in this market. And that's very important. It's as if you read my mind on the incentive side in particular, because one of the arguments I've tried making um, pretty much for the last three to four years in every budget cycle to the tax authorities and the finance ministry is the stick approach to formalization of the economy has failed. And yeah. the more you try to use the stick in terms of forcing people to become filers of taxes, A, I make this argument a lot to people in Pakistan. It's a myth that filing taxes equals compliance with taxes. It doesn't. Everybody pays taxes in Pakistan through the GST. Just because you're oh. filing, it doesn't mean you're a taxpayer. You, a lot of people have zero taxes in their filings in any case. Um, but that approach of the state taking a stick and forcing you to do it actually has the reverse effect because then people are scared that this tax man is going to hound me forever, which is what happens in Pakistan. Then, then you go into the informal channel. And if you provide that incentive and saying, hey, if you accept digital payments, that 18% GST is going to be 10% or whatever that number will be, the consumer will demand the merchant, hey, I want to pay digitally because I want to save on that money, right? Um, and you have formalization, a larger pie means a lower rate required to raise the same amount of money over time. And you can be creative um, because otherwise it's not going to work, right? And it has all sorts of positive benefits on credit creation, formalization of deposits, et cetera, uh, which is a macro problem in Pakistan. So I, I wanted to just echo your point on incentives. And then I think also on the in level playing field side, right? I think it's one of the things in, in Pakistan in particular, you see because growth is hard and scarce to come by, um, everybody tries to protect their sort of wall garden and say, this is my turf and I want government protection to save my profits, uh, which has created a rent-seeking economy. But in areas like digitization, the pie is large enough, the market is large enough for everybody to play and everybody should be allowed to have that competition through digitization and innovation, whether it's a legacy bank, whether it's Visa or somebody else, whether it's a foreign entrant or a domestic on entrepreneur. Um, and I think sometimes policymakers also lose sight of that, that the market, despite all the issues in Pakistan, is large enough to foster a lot of competition and competition yeah. is good um, in terms of that. So I just wanted to echo um, those two points. And, and I'm glad that that's where you and Visa are focused in Pakistan as well. Um, the last question I had, um, again, uh, this has been, by the way, a wonderful conversation in terms of understanding you so your priorities. <laughs> um, I always ask my guests, as you probably know, what are two or three books you would recommend yes. uh, to the audience? I, and, I, I, and actually, listening to your podcast, I love this question because it gives me also a lot of inspiration. So um, so I have a classic, uh, a management book that is a classic, and it's, it's it's been a game changer at a, at a specific point in my career. And it's the How to Win Friends and Influence Others by Dale Carnegie. I love this book. Um, and it's not only in my career, but it's also, I think it's a very good book in your personal relationships, your friendships, your relationship with your spouse, uh, with your kids. So uh, I highly recommend this. There's another one I read recently um that was actually given to me by the by our head of strategy at visa and it's called good strategy bad strategy by um richard romit and and it it is a reminder of how much strategy is the number one job of any leader and unfortunately strategy has developed into too many you know fluffy concepts and buzzwords nice powerpoint slides <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah and 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 people think that because they have financial goals then they have a strategy and the author uh, actually talks about steve jobs um when steve jobs came back to apple and and by the way steve Jobs is known that someone who never actually spoke about financials but one of the example he gave is when a friend of Steve came to him and asked him which, lap which laptop she should buy. And he could not really tell her which one and why. And this is where he decided, okay, we scrap everything. We're going to focus in every product line. We're going to focus on one thing and we're going to do it so well. Mm -hmm. 
So that's the good strategy, bad strategy. I highly recommend it. It's a very easy read. Um, but any leader who's thinking of strategy and doesn't want fluffy concepts should, should go there. And, and the third book is a fiction book. Um, it's um, A Gentleman in Moscow by Amor Tolis. It's an interesting one because, uh, so I am someone who looks at Bill Gates' reading list. So he has the winter reading list and the summer reading list. And he has a lot of reading lists. And most of the books he has on his reading list are pretty serious books, mm -hmm. <laughs> pretty difficult to read. Uh, but this is one of the rare uh, fiction books, actually, on his reading list. So I was I was intrigued when I saw it on the reading. When I read it, it's I do understand why. I mean, it's, it's uh, a beautiful. I, I've read it. It's it's amazing. Yeah. You, it, it just puts you. I think the author does a fantastic job of taking you in into the lives of the characters in a exactly. way that very few books do. Yeah. And, and, I, and I love fiction books. Exactly what you said. You know, I love fiction books that feel like you're watching a movie. I mean, you're reading this book, but it's like you're actually watching it. Uh, from the description and everything else so yeah that's um th these are my books yeah those are really great recommendations I haven't read good strategy bad strategy so I'll, I'll pick that up probably because I do some strategy work and I need to look at that for sure. uh, for for my own work as well but the other two I've read and they're fantastic I think um, how to win friends uh, if you just look at the title kind of sounds sinister uh, but it's not actually, uh, it's actually a really, really good guide for your life, as you said, um, across the board professionally and personally, and a gentleman on Moscow. I mean, if you even if you don't like fiction, I, I would highly recommend yes. uh, people read that because just so beautifully written and the scene setting and the characters and, and everything else is, is yes. wonderful. So Leila, again, thank you so much for taking out the time. This was wonderful. Uh, and I hope to, you know, meet you in person sometime soon. Uh, but in the meantime, good luck with everything that you and your team are doing in Pakistan. And I think the opportunity is real. If you succeed, I think there's a transformative impact uh, for the country. So wish you all the best. And again, thank you for joining us today. And thank you so much for having me. And definitely, I hope to see you soon.